Hello beautiful people, my name is Bridget and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is another hair time and true crime where today we are talking about the case of Evelyn Hartley who was a babysitter who went missing a week before Halloween on her babysitting job and we will also be cutting my hair. I got professional hair cutting scissors here from Sally's and today since I can't go get a haircut I'm going to tell you this story and cut some of this off. So without any further ado let's go ahead and get to today's video. Okay guys, before we get started, this is an educational video, not on hair because I am not a hair professional, but I am trying to tell you this case. She is a missing person to this day and do not do things that I do to my hair to yourself because I do this for fun and if it turns out a little too short, I will survive. Unlike the last time I cut my hair on this channel and I freaked out, but regardless, <laughs> let's get into the case. So this story takes place a week before Halloween on October 24th, 1953 in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So Evelyn Hartley was a 15-year-old girl, a junior in her high school, a straight-A honor student, and she lived with her parents as well as her four siblings. Well, she was one of four siblings. Unfortunately, she was one of three at this time because her brother had passed away from polio years earlier, but she was originally one of four children. Now, her family moved to La Crosse in 1950, and they've been living there ever since. Her father was a biology professor, and her mother worked from home. Now, on October 24th, when this case took place, Evelyn was picked up around 6 p.m. by her father's co-worker, Vigo Rasperson. I don't know if I'm saying that last name, pronoun I'm pronouncing that last name correctly, but Vigo Rasperson was her father's co-worker. He was a physics professor. Her father was a biology professor working at the local college, and he gave a ride home to Mr. Rasperson's house to babysit. Now, Mr. Rasperson, his wife and their older daughter were going to a football game that night. It was a homecoming game, and it was a big deal in their town, so they wanted to attend. However, the Raspersons had a 20-month-old, a year-and-a-half-old daughter, Janice, and they couldn't leave her home alone. And their regular babysitter, also named Janice, was attending the football game as well. So they hired Evelyn to babysit for them that night. Evelyn was brought to the home around 6 p.m. and the daughter was supposed to be in bed around 7 p.m. So the Rasperson family left and left Evelyn to put the baby to bed about an hour later. Now because most of the night the baby would be sleeping, Evelyn brought a bunch of school books with her so she could study while the baby slept. Ah! Now the Rasperson home was only about five minutes away from where Evelyn lived and she was supposed to call around 8.30 to let her parents know, because she was only 15, how the night was going. But at 8.30, no call ever arrived from Evelyn and when he called the house, her father Richard called the house, there was no answer and he couldn't get a hold of her. He also called a bunch of the neighbors and no one had seen Evelyn. Now after not being able to get a hold of Evelyn that night, around 9.20 p.m., her father Richard arrived at the Rasperson house to check on her. All the doors and the windows were locked. There was no curtains on the front living room window so he could see right in after knocking and yelling her name and no one answered the door, he looked in and saw Evelyn's school books disheveled and thrown across the floor as well as one of her shoes and Evelyn's glasses which she always wore but were, they were crushed. So he was really concerned and tried to find a way into the home. Now all the windows were locked at this time, however when he walked around the back of the house the basement window was open and the screen was hanging out and there was also a ladder on the inside as if someone had walked their like oh wait the ladder out of the basement so he went into that opening in the basement to go look for Evelyn and saw one of her shoes the other shoe at the bottom of air freshener at the bottom of the basement stairs did I cut too much off so I could cut too much off I didn't think about this I just started cutting and I think I cut a little bit too much off I should have left it a little longer oh well be okay oh yeah this is too short especially when it's gonna be like clean when I clean my hair and I'll fluff it up it's gonna be too short <laughs> I always do this to myself. I always do this to myself. Oh well, it's too late now. Let's even it out. Now, once Richard got into the home, he could not find Evelyn anywhere. However, the baby Janice was still fine and she was still asleep and she was still tucked into bed like she had put to bed at the normal time. So, Evelyn was missing at this point and she's still missing now technically. So, they phoned the police. He went to a neighbor's house and had them phone the police. 
When the police got there, they noticed several signs that made them think that this was, in fact, an abduction. Besides the furniture and the books and everything moved in the living room to look like a struggle, there were also a bunch of screw marks, like someone had tried to pry to open a lot of the windows until they decided to go through the basement window. There were also sneaker marks, like someone was standing in the flower bed near a window. The only other signs of physical evidence in this case were two small piles of blood, one found outside of the home and one found near a neighbor's garage. There was also a bloody handprint near the neighbor's garage. Both of these blood piles were type A, which matched Evelyn. There was also red fibers found in the blood piles, and Evelyn was wearing red pants at the time of her disappearance. Now, as far as witnesses goes, there were no witnesses to the actual abduction or taking of Evelyn. However, there were a couple witnesses around 7 to 7 15 p.m. who heard screaming. Now, they just assumed this was kids playing or something not that serious, so no one reported these until after Evelyn went missing. There was also reports around 8 p.m., which would be a totally different timeline from both of these counts adding up, of a tan sedan circling the neighborhood at least three times. The last witness report was of a man who saw around 7.15 p.m. two men and a woman kind of staggering along the road. Now, this could have been because Evelyn was injured that she was staggering. However, this man just assumed they were three drunks and didn't think anything of it and only reported it until after Evelyn went missing. On October 27th, so three days after Evelyn went missing, there was a set of undergarments, so panties and a bra, found along the side of a highway. They were Evelyn's size and the blood found on them were type A, which was Evelyn's blood type. Now just four miles down the road from that, there were a pair of jeans found, men's jeans, that also contained blood, but which could not be determined what kind of blood type it was. On Halloween, so a week after Evelyn's disappearance, there was a denim jacket and a size 11 men's pair of shoes found with blood on them as well. Now they assumed that these were belonging to the perpetrator even though it was a week later because the shoes imprints did match the shoe imprints found in the flower bed that night at the home. A huge search was started with over 2,000 people volunteering to help look for Evelyn, which didn't turn up many leads. And in 1954, the following year after this, the police decided to do the nation's biggest lie detector test, so polygraphing over 1,750 people, all the male students and faculty from all the high schools in the district. Now, after about 300 people, the school board did stop this and make the police department stop interviewing every single male, but they did have the intention of doing every single person that could have been around Evelyn in some way and interviewing them and giving a polygraph test. Now that's about all we have for evidence in this case. It really doesn't have too much evidence. The eyewitnesses and people hearing screaming were the only like evidence they had to help find Evelyn and they never did. Now the only like progression that's ever happened in the case, there's been a few suspects but nothing super substantial. One suspect that you may have heard of is Ed Gain. Now Ed Gain, probably like honestly out of every serial killer, it's probably the creepiest one. And I don't even know if you would really consider him a serial killer. Everyone does, but he only killed two people that we know of for sure. However, Ed Gein is known for being the inspiration for many classic horror icons, including um, ugh, Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs, as well as Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's the inspiration for many classic horror characters. Now, Ed Gein is known for digging up corpses, using their skin, and making art out of it and like laying with dead corpses and things like that. Now he only killed two people that we know of. However, Ed Gein was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin where this story took place and he was living in a nearby town of Wisconsin. There's this rumor that maybe Ed was visiting family in La Crosse. However, personally I don't believe this because Ed Gein never seemed like the person to go visit anyone besides his mom when they were living together and she was still alive because he is also the inspiration for um, Bates Motel. So, yeah, psycho. <laughs> Anyways, there is no, I don't know why I laughed. It's just a classic movie, I don't know. There is no more evidence about Evelyn's disappearance. There's never been an arrest in this case, and it's been 66 years since this took place. 
Now, there has been a couple of suspects over the years. Someone said it could have been someone, because the denim jacket had wear under the arms, like from a support harness, that it could have been someone who works on steeples or on rooftops. It could have been someone, there was an anonymous call when the outfit was shown on TV, that it could have been a local farmer who was deceased by the time they could even interview him. Honestly, there's not too many leads in this case, and it's rather unfortunate, because this is like the classic, the classic horror trope of a babysitter getting attacked while working and I feel like that's really I mean it's a weird trope to be sure because it's something that happens a lot in movies and I don't feel like it's something that happens all the time in real life I think it's just the idea of being in a different environment not your own home and something bad happening to you because you do feel weird in someone else's environment and I feel like that's what causes a lot of the stereotypes of the babysitter stories and stuff my hair is super uneven, you guys, and the back is not completely done yet, but this side's shorter than this side, but I refuse to fix it. <laughs> I refuse to fix it. I might fix it a little bit. No, I'm not going to fix it. This side's just going to be shorter. I'm just going to let it grow out. I don't care. It's fine. Okay, maybe I'll chop a little off. <laughs> Anyways, you guys, that is all the information we have on this case. I am going to go finish chopping a little bit of this hair off. Take a shower, get all the dead ends off, style it a little bit, and I'll be right back to show you the finished hair. Alright guys, so I don't know the last time I've worn a lipstick this pink in my life. I just put it on because I wanted to start contrast from my first look in this video. But, yeah, pink's not for me anymore, you guys. I used to love this lip color. Now I, ha I want nothing to do with it. But anyways, this is my hair cut. This side's a little longer. I personally do not care. And... I think it came out cute, but not too cutesy and too short like it was last time we cut my hair. Anyways, you guys, theories on what happened to Evelyn. Personally, my personal opinion is it probably was a burglary gone wrong. I don't think many people probably knew that she was going to be there that night. Maybe because it was a professor's house and either the family would be out of that game and everyone in that town were going to the homecoming game. Maybe someone tried to break into the house and see if they could get some belongings and stuff and then encountered Evelyn there and maybe things went wrong that way. That's personally what I think just because when people know someone's out of their house it's easier to break into and steal things. There was nothing taken from the home but that is the strongest theory the police have and I agree with it. As far as the suspects I don't think Ed Gein had anything to do with it. I feel like it's just an outlandish thing just because another crime happened in a similar place to where Ed Gein once lived. I mean, he was arrested in 1957. This happened in 1953. It was only four years later. So I feel like if he was going to confess everything like he did and then claim insanity, because he never actually went to real prison. He went to like a mental, a mental institution until he died in the 80s. So I think he probably would have admitted if he did this to Evelyn just a couple years before he got arrested, but he never did. And I don't really see any connection other than being in the same state in a nearby town. So I don't think it has anything to do with Ed Gain. As far as the other suspects, I'm not really sure. If you guys have any theories on this case, I would love to hear it down below. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. Be sure to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.